Why is it when professional and Hollywood cinematographers pick up their camera, their work looks so much better than ours? Well, it's not just because they have better gear or bigger crews or bigger lighting packages, although those all do factor in. There is one skill set that separates them from everyone else, and that's crafting the light motivation. This is the art of determining where light is naturally motivated in an environment and adding in your own film lights or augmenting what's there so that it looks seamless and invisible to the viewer's eye. Good cinematographers can take a light and make it look good on someone. But great cinematographers can take that same light, make the scene look beautiful, as if there was no lights added at all. This is the true artistry of great cinematographers, is that when they pick up the camera and design their lighting setups and decide where to put their shot, it looks true, authentic, but still just has that little extra touch of something that helps us as an audience escape reality when we watch the films. In this video, I'm gonna break down and help you design your shots so that they don't feel lit or sourcey, where it feels like there's a light directly in the scene. I was motivated, no pun intended, to make this video because I was just on a panel yesterday. I got to moderate with four incredible cinematographers who all had feature films playing at TIFF right now. Let's get into some quick tips here of crafting light motivation and where it comes from. And then I'm gonna show some scenes and break that down. The four core tips I would say is where the light direction's coming from, where your camera placement is, what is the quality of the light, and what is the color temperature. So first, where is the light naturally coming from in your scene? In the case of this room, I have these windows here. Just pull my camera up here. See, I have these windows off to the side here. That's why when I added one light in here, I'm naturally taking the same direction from where that light is already coming from, from the windows. This feels naturally motivated. I'll actually just turn the light off here. You can see this is what it looks like without the light, and then this is what it looks like with the light. But watching this video, this would have felt naturally motivated from the start because I've placed my light from the same general area of where this window's coming from. So you believe it could be window light. You can see here in this shot from All Quiet on the Western Front, They've established with the pan in that there is this giant light source coming through what we believe is a window. Now this could just be an 18K just off camera or actually a big light source punching through a window, but we believe it the way it's falling on their faces here. This is their main key side and it's a bit softer. And then our subjects in the foreground here have some sort of top lighting, which we get to see later on is actually a skylight. All of the light that falls on our subject's face in this scene comes from directions that are believable. A cinematographer always considers where their light's coming from. Is it a natural direction? Because lights just don't appear on walls. And that's where the second point camera direction. Where you place your camera in the room will directly impact this because if you're trying to add light to your person's face and your camera's pointing towards the main light source, you then have to add in more film lighting and this is where can, things can start to look not as real. When you place your camera down, you begin adding lights on your set, ask yourself, could there be a light source here? In this home or space or environment, could there be a street light or an overhead ceiling light or a lamp to motivate this? We teach this in the Cinematic Eye, our course. You'll see us when we set up this nighttime bedroom scene. We're lighting our subject's face using lamps and making it seem as if it was some ambient light coming in through the windows. A cinematographer should be considering where they place their camera in the room because this will determine where the lights come from. As we've established here, there's a window off to the side. We can see the daylight spilling on the ground. So we believe that this light source on my face is true, even though I'm adding a little light extra to it. Now, if we were to suddenly add a light to the far side, my fill side, that's a bit too bright, it becomes unbelievable. Here we are, this now feels lit. This feels like some sort of cheap documentary shot. We no longer believe it. Of course, if this was a documentary and we wanted just to have lots of light everywhere, it's appropriate. But if you're doing a scripted film, this suddenly feels fake. Same goes if we place me in front of this window here. I'm silhouetted and I'm dark. This is naturally what it would look like. Now we could add a little bit of fill light to make this more believable. But if we suddenly punch a ton of light onto my face, let's get a better frame here. Uh, stop talking, Mark. There we go. Great frame. Yeah, beautiful. This works for a documentary in our interview, but again, for scripted, if we're trying to make it feel believable, I mean, heck, we can even see the reflection here of the light. You have to think, where would this light source be coming? Is this an overhead light? 
Maybe we could get away with this as being believable, but it really starts to feel lit. Knowing where to place your camera and then what adds to light around that will help you make the scene feel more realistic. The next is quality of light. What is the type of light falling on your subject from that natural direction? So what I mean is with these windows here, this is indirect light, so it's gonna be soft bounce light. That's why I'm using a soft box. But had it been direct sunlight, this is where you want a hard light. This is where the light isn't as soft and it's gonna give more defined features and a harder edge light. There wouldn't be as much diffusion reaching me. So when you're adding lights into a scene, you have to determine what quality of light would naturally be coming from that. If it's a lamp, it's going to be softer. But if it's just a bare bulb on the ceiling or in some just ugly household pot lighting, that will be harder. That will be a more defined edge. So this is direct sunlight here. That's why it's so hard and you're seeing really sharp shadows being cast. That's what happens with hard lighting. We can believe that this is sunlight coming through the window, even though again, it's probably a film light. This shot from Revolutionary Road has a mixed quality of light. We have the hard sunlight in the background here, casting really sharp shadows. But then on our lead actress's face, Kate Winslet, I believe, we have soft light hitting her. We might be able to believe that this is soft if we were have a wide shot to see some shears or curtains there casting that softer light, diffusing it before it hits her face. Or perhaps we believe that this is maybe bouncing off something in the room. If you're not considering the quality of light reaching your subject's face or the background, things will start to feel a little less realistic because in everyday light, light isn't always all soft or all hard. And if you don't know how to shape lighting, we can help you with this. We have a whole cinematography course. It's over 60 videos. I'm telling you about it right now because we are about to close the doors at the end of this week. We only open the doors to our film academy, The Art of Documentary, twice a year. Cinematography course includes a huge variety of instructors, including people like Adam Madrick, who you saw on that panel going into the depths of cinematography, but also giving you a foundational base of how to do things like expose your image, the difference between hard and soft lighting like I'm talking, but then we get into the depths of actually how to shape your lighting, how to add things to the scene to break up that hard lighting so that it still feels natural. We want you to have the cinematic eye. This is being able to look into a room and know where to place your camera, how to shape the light, and how to tell the best story possible. Jump in now, I put a link down at the bottom the early bird sale is over, but I have included an extra 10% discount code if you want to jump in and get one of our bundles as well. Okay, the last tip for you when you're shaping your light is of course color temperature. If it's daylight, you want your light to be closer to 5600. If it's a tungsten bulb that you're trying to emulate, then you want to be closer down to 3200 Kelvin. This is so that you're matching the color temperatures. If suddenly you have a bright red light coming in through a space and it doesn't feel like there could be any sort of sign outside or something motivating that, that's when things start getting kind of into the music video or more impressionistic territory. It's not that this is wrong, but you have to commit to that knowing that your audience will know that you've added lights into the scene or that you're making an artistic statement. Color temperature really matters too for creating a believable scene for light motivation. Here we see Amy Adams laying in her bed. This is daylight. You can see it's that cool kind of 5600 more white bluish light landing on her. Perhaps in the film they would have established a wide shot seeing some of that come in through the window. But we don't necessarily need it because it's a bit of a darker room. It feels like this could be early morning morning light. Even though you can even see a pretty hard catch light in her face here. It's soft, diffused light. The idea is that this is coming through some blinds. Whereas when we see Jake Gyllenhaal over here, this is orange, more warmer tungsten lighting. And we know this because there's a wide shot here in the movie. Even though there's a bit of a daylight spilling in through here, they've established that the main sources, even this tiny little lamp here, the cinematographer would have added that little sliver of it in the shot so that when we cut to this medium shot here of him, we believe that there would be that much tungsten lighting hitting him. It's a heck of a lot, but they've established that there's two lamps in the room. They showed it spilling across the bed here. So we believe that this is a realistic amount of tungsten light hitting him. You can see here too, there's some daylight. This is a mixed lighting scenario. We have the daylight coming in through the shears here, through the curtains, reaching his back, just a really soft, subtle backlighting, but that's intentional so that he can be separate from the background. 
And then we have these tungsten bulbs here. Perhaps they even added these in. They might not have been in the room originally, or they might have chosen this room because they had them. Or perhaps this is even a set that they built. But this was intentional as well, giving this a bit of daylight here, this mixed lighting source. We're able to separate Jake from the background here and so that we can fully see the outline of his body. But his main source is the tungsten lighting. My opinion, it looks great. It's more dynamic. And you know what? I can believe it, even though I don't imagine any hotel room would be this bright from just a couple lamps. There's one takeaway from this video. It's that you always want to be immersing your audience in the story and your lighting should be subtle. It shouldn't always feel like you are trying to get another shot from your demo reel. It doesn't always mean that every shot has to be the most perfect and pristine in terms of his lighting. You don't even need to have backlighting for every shot. I think imperfection is often perfection in filmmaking because it helps us as a viewer forget that we're watching the movie and really feel like the people on screen are living out a true life experience. So thanks for watching again. This is your last chance to jump into AOD. Our doors are closing this week, September 22nd. The next chance you'll have to get in is the new year. AOD isn't just course videos, it's a thriving community of filmmakers. When you buy a course, you get lifetime access to those videos and to our Facebook group, which has thousands of filmmakers from around the world. And we watch people connect with people from their country, from their city, and even crew up their films and get new work from the Facebook community and from our monthly calls. Thank you so much for watching this. I hate goodbyes. See you in the next one. <laughs>